So let's begin lecture four. That's going to be on Lorentz transformations, the generalization of Galilean transformations from Newton's world to Einstein's world. And we'll take a look at the addition of velocities. Remember in Galileo's world, they, they just add linearly. It can't be true in Einstein's world because it's not consistent with the existence of a speed limit. So let's see what the, what the rule is uh, for adding velocities. And then let's take a look at the metric. Okay, we'll start doing some more formal things so that we can develop a language to do relativity in a, uh, in a more fundamental fashion than just looking at examples and trying to infer general properties from them. We're going to want to move <coughs> uh, to discussions which begin with uh, space and time measurements and, uh, and uh, uh, grow the formulas uh, from, from there. So let's get time dilation, Lorentz contraction, and the relativity of simultaneity in one formula. So this formula is going to be great for us. We won't have to think quite so hard about, about these subtle effects. Uh, the Lorentz transformation uh, formula will be a plug-in formula and will help us along with that. So to begin, we uh, recall the Galilean transformations between a frame S and a frame S prime that's moving with a velocity V with respect to it. And in Galilean transformations, we know how to relate space-time measurements between the two inertial frames. Uh, x is equal to x prime plus vt, and t is equal to t prime, as we've discussed uh, thoroughly uh, before. Okay. Now, in, uh, in Einstein's uh, world, we, uh, we replace a, a, a static space-time with a Minkowski diagram. And here I've shown you the Minkowski diagram. Uh, for the usual uh, situation where uh, the velocity between S and S prime is positive. So the first task we're going to do uh, is, to, uh, is to get uh, how uh, spatial uh, measurements uh, relate, and then we'll turn to the equation for how temporal uh, relationships relate between the two frames. Okay, so now uh, here is the relationship uh, given by Galileo. And uh, let's think about it. Let's think about it again. It says that x is equal to x prime plus vt. So x prime is the distance in the moving frame. Ah, well we can fix this one up rather easily. X prime is the distance in the moving frame. So I already know that x prime will contract to x prime over gamma when I generalize to Einstein's world. So in, in Einstein's world, x is going to be x prime over gamma plus vt. All the other objects are just related to the to the uh, to the uh, reference frame S. It's just the the prime one that I have to think about, and I know Lorentz uh, contraction, so I correct it. So now I'll solve for x prime, and here's my first uh, member of the Lorentz contraction uh, uh, system of two of two equations. That x prime, okay, the position in the x direction is equal to gamma times x minus vt. Okay, that was, uh, that was easy, and we see the gamma factor of, uh, of relativity, the one over the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared, correcting the Galilean transformation. Now what about t prime? Ah, but now look at this, look at this Minkowski diagram, and notice the symmetries in it. I know now how x prime is related to x and t. Uh, but if I look at the diagram and I'm thinking about how to transform t, I see that t prime is related to t and x in the same way that x prime is related to x and x and t. So the relation, and that's stated here, the relation of t prime to t and x is the same as the relation between x prime to x and t. So I already know how x prime transforms. So I can just make these substitutions and find out how t prime transforms. I just look at my picture and I see, well, if you take x prime to t prime, x to t, and t to x, you'll get the new transformation. Put the factors of c in there appropriately. Okay, so I'll just make that substitution in my first member of the Lorentz transformations. Okay, and x prime goes to ct prime, gamma to gamma, x goes to ct, t goes to v over c. That just makes this part of the figure the same as this part of the figure. 
Now I solve for t prime, and I get the t prime is gamma t minus vx over c squared. And that's the end of it. I'm done. That's the derivation of Lorentz transformation. It wasn't very hard, okay? We, we've done the work already when we, when we thought about Lorentz contraction and Minkowski diagrams. So Minkowski diagrams have built into them the idea that the speed of light is a universal constant the same in all frames. So that's what has guided us to the Lorentz transformations. Well, let's see. In, uh, in uh, Newton's world, T prime would be T. Well, I can, I can see that occurring here in the limit that the, that the speed limit goes to infinity. This term disappears and gamma goes to 1. So I can, I can uh, retrieve a Newtonian physics in that, in that funny way. And you can check in a lot of the formulas that you get that you can let C go to infinity and, and, and get uh, a Newtonian uh, equation back. But sometimes you've got to be careful about that because there might be some C's hidden in other parts of the, of, of the equation. So it, as, as always, when you take limits, uh, be careful and make everything, everything explicit. So now we have everything in one linear transformation, and let's re-derive time dilation, Lorentz contraction, and the relativity of simultaneity just from these two equations. Those two equations make up the Lorentz transformation. So to do time dilation, well, I just consider a clock at rest in the frame S, and I measure two ticks on it, T2 and T1. Now those ticks occur on a clock at rest in S, so the clock doesn't move, so X is equal to X2 is equal to X1. Let's view that measurement from the perspective of S prime. So I just take this formula, and I evaluate it for the first tick and the second tick, and take the difference, that's what's done here, All right? I just plug it in. Okay, and finally, I use the fact that the clock, by definition, does not move in frame S. So this term disappears, x2 is equal to x1. And so I get t2 prime, the delta t2 prime is equal to gamma delta t. Uh, but delta t, you see, that's in the frame where the clock is at rest. That's what I call the proper time. And so that's delta tau. So we got it. Okay, time dilation. The, the observer who, uh, who observes a moving clock says it moves slowly by a factor of gamma, a factor of gamma that depends upon the velocity of the moving clock. Okay. Well, let's con Lorentz contraction. Uh, let's imagine a rod at rest in one of the frames. It's convenient to choose that frame to be S prime. And then we're going to move, we're going to measure uh, the length of that rod in S. So we're going to notice the endpoints of the, of, the, of the rod, x1 and x2, I call them. And when S measures the, the, the length of the moving rod, he has to do it in such a way that he looks at the x2 value and the x1 value simultaneously in his frame. He doesn't want the rod to be moving in, in, from his perspective during the measurement course. Okay, so t is equal to t1 equal t2. Okay. Then I go back to my Lorentz transformation for x, and I do it for, for uh, x1 and x2, and I get x2 prime minus x1 prime is equal to gamma, difference of x's minus v, difference of t's. That's just plugging into the first of the Lorentz transformations. Well, the rod is at rest in s prime, so this is the proper distance. I make the measurement in, in the frame s, uh, observing both of the ends at the same time, so the time difference goes away. This becomes just gamma x2 minus x1. So I learned from this that when I measure the length of the rod in the, in, the, in the frame in which the rod is moving at velocity v, delta x, I get delta x is equal to L naught, the proper, di the proper length, divided by gamma. Well, I got Lorentz contraction again. Okay, so that was, again, uh, pretty easy. I had to be careful about how I do the measurements, right? Uh, I had to be careful that I that, I, that in the frame S, I look at the position of the ends of the rod, of the moving rod, at the same time. That's critical in, in this. Okay, good. Two out of three. Let's go for relativity of simultaneity. 
the fact that if you synchronize your clocks in one frame and they're separated in the x direction, they won't be synchronized in the other frame, and we know the formula for how much they won't be synchronized. Okay, so I'll specify a time in, S, in, in the frame S prime. I'll call that T prime sub C, and just plug that into, into my Lorentz transformation. So I'm going to look at a specific time, T prime, in the frame S prime, and see what that corresponds to. Well, I see, I see it corresponds uh, not to a specific time, but a, uh, but there's a mixing in of space, and so we, and so we find uh, something very similar to what we had uh, before. Uh, you know that the specifying a time in one frame doesn't specify a time in the other frame; it specifies a, a a line which is inclined to the to the time axis. Okay. Now it's convenient uh, uh, to uh, to to uh, note by time dilation, okay, that that that, that uh, t prime will measure the the time t c dilated, okay. So I can clean this formula up a bit, okay. And so so re replacing t prime uh, by gamma uh, t, okay, just time dilation. The uh, uh, the moving clock is observed to run slowly, okay. Then I can I can just put that into this into this formula to clean it up, ca uh, cancel off the gamma factors, and and get this relationship, or I can write it really in uh, for for t, okay. So t of x then is t c plus v over c squared x. I'm just making explicit the fact that if you specify a time t prime in in one frame. Uh, you get a line of, of times in the other in the other frame, and, and here it is. We've seen this before, right? And here's the Minkowski diagram for it. So here I have my my clocks, which are at rest in the frame S. So their world paths are, are just vertical, are just vertical like that, and uh, and I have my frame S prime moving by. So it's X prime. Uh, uh, axis, its lines of constant uh, t prime are inclined at an angle theta, like this. Okay, so they cut across at an angle. So when I specify t prime is a constant, I see that the clocks, okay, which were synchronized in the frame S, and so appear like this, appear at different times because it's of uh, course of the angle of information of this of this relative to the simultaneous uh, axis in the frame S, which is horizontal, like, like that, shows me that, that the clocks, that this clock is earlier uh, than, 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 than this clock. So again, I see that the leading clock lags behind, and I can read off how much it is by this, by this formula o over here. I notice how f the difference of, of the expositions of the, of the clocks in the frame in which they are at rest. I know the velocity that the frame is going by me, and so I can calculate for you the, um, you know, the, the the times of each one of those clocks by just plugging in the position of A, B, C, D, and E. And I chose here to have the the clock C at x equals zero, so that that sets my that that, that sets down my uh, my uh, curve. So again, that, I think that's that's relatively easy. And again, we see how relativity or simultaneity works. Okay, specifying a time in one frame specifies a line in the in, in, uh, an inclined line in the other frame, and so and so uh, I see a different a different time uh, uh, when I specify a time in one frame and look at the clocks in the moving frame. So in summary, here you go. Here's Einstein. Here's the Lorentz transformation we just we just derived, and we rederived from them uh, time dilation, Lorentz contraction, and uh, and the uh, rule of simultaneity, and we compare them to Newton, and that's written down here. And th and then we see, of course, the differences. That t is universal for Newton, but c is universal for Einstein. Okay. And we see one of the one of the major differences between a Newton and Einstein is the fact that in, in Einstein's rules, has, he has a new dimensionful scale, the speed of light, the speed limit. 
okay, that's what's coming in here. That's what's uh, caused us to rethink space and time measurements. It's the appearance of that new scale that allows all these new phenomena to occur in Einstein's world. And I point that out in comment three here. In, in Newton's world, there is no sense of slow or fast. In Einstein's, there is. Now, why is there no sense of, of slow or fast in Newton's world? Well, in Newton's world, you can move at any velocity you want to. So if you have a particle or a frame moving past you at uh, 1,000 miles per hour, you can just boost by 1,000 miles per hour and get into his initial frame. He's not moving there, and that frame has the same physics as the frame that we started out in. So I've eliminated the velocity, his velocity completely. There's no sense to, to fast or slow, okay, in, 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 this, in this example, okay? But in Einstein's, well, there is a, there is a difference. There's a scale on velocities. If you, have a, if you accelerate a, uh, a particle to a velocity comparable to the speed of light, that's fast. Because the speed limit is the speed limit. You can't go faster than that. But if V over C is much, much less than 1, then that's slow. Okay, we have a scale for velocities. The theory of relativity brings in a new scale. In some sense, the New Newtonian transformations, the Galilean transformations, have a kind of scale invariance, and Einstein's theory does not have that invariance. And that's the, that's the crux of the matter in, uh, in the Lorentz transformations as compared to the Galilean uh, transformations. Okay, so finally, let's take a look at, uh, look at velocities. How do velocities, quote, add in Einstein's world? We know in Newton's world that, that they just add algebraically, and, we, and we're very comfortable with that idea. So let's, let's, uh, let's use the Lorentz transformations and see how velocities add. So I imagine I have my usual setup of S and S prime. Okay, and in S prime I have a velocity which is moving to the right at a velocity V sub particle prime. That's written here, okay? Now S observes that particle, and, and S sees it moving to the right at a, at a, at a constant velocity but a different one, so I write V sub P T. The question is, what's the relation of V sub P to V sub P prime? It should be related by V, okay, the velocity between the two frames. In the case of uh, Galileo, you just add the two to make, up, uh, to make up V. V will be just V prime plus V, but it's not gonna be that case in Einstein's world. Let's see what it is. So. So here, I know the position as a function of time in S prime. I know the position as a function of time in S. Plug it into the Lorentz transformations. Here's the Lorentz transformation for X prime and T prime. X prime, in this case, replaced by this formula. That's all I do. And X is replaced by this formula, this linear motion. I put that in. Okay, so, so V prime uh, t prime is equal to gamma. I can pull out the t and get this, okay? And then similarly in the, in the equation for, for time, I just put in what x is. x is v sub p times t, pull out t, and there you go. Oh, but now, uh, but now the, uh, the velocity, of course, I can isolate that just by dividing this equation by this equation. No complicated algebra. Okay, just divide one equation by the other. The gammas cancel out, and there you go. Okay, so I get V prime sub, sub P is equal to VP minus V. That's what I would ex have expected in Newton's world, but it's corrected by this denominator, right? And I, re I see this denominator. This denominator is the denominator that gets the relativity of simultaneity correct. I'll see this factor again and again. And it, and its, its, its core, its foundation, is from the expression in this, in the Lorentz transformation of the relativity of simultaneity. That's going to save my neck in all of these equations and, and give me the rules of Einstein's, uh, Einstein's uh, world and keep the velocity as a universal constant. So, so here it is. 
So Vp minus V divided by 1 minus V times V sub P over C squared. Okay, nonlinear as, as the Dickens. Well, if, uh, if these velocities are small compared to C, you know, then Galileo works to good approximation with small correction. Now also I can take this, this, this equation and, and, and uh, go the other way, okay, and get the velocity of the particle in S if I knew it in S prime. Well, you can do the algebra to invert this equation, but you know, don't, <laughs> you know, don't, don't waste your time. The obvious thing to do instead is just to flip the relative velocity of the two frames from v to minus v. Right? Well, you can do the algebra, just invert this, okay, and check that you get this. So that the, so that the, the trickery of just of noticing the symmetry that v is the relative velocity of one frame to the other. You can switch them by just taking v to minus v. Works. Okay. Okay. Once you you get the hang of these things, you know you can you can manipulate the formulas very uh, uh, you know very, very uh, much to your to your favor. But first time it's good to be careful. Okay. Now the one thing we want to check, and this is important, is to check that this this nonlinear equation keeps the velocity of light a constant in all frames. Okay, so let's so let's let, uh, so let's take a look at that. Okay, so let's put v prime sub p equal to c in here. Okay, okay, well, I guess in this one. Okay, so put so upstairs I'll get c plus v. Okay, now I now now I okay now I now downstairs if I put v prime p equal to c I see downstairs. Okay, uh, then uh, then I would I would get. Okay, making a, a minor correction on, on the fly here. Sorry, guys. Okay, this of course is fine. Okay. Uh, then what? Then what I would get? I would put a C up here. That would cancel one of the C's downstairs. You see, and so and so and so and so uh, uh, downstairs. If I pull the C out, I would have I would have a C plus V upstairs, and then I and then I would have one over C times C plus V downstairs. And I would guess just get Vp is equal to C. Okay, the dependence of, upon uh, upon V disappears between the numerator and the denominator when you put V prime P equal to C in this formula. Okay, so it does it does what it was intended to do. But of course, that was built in right from the start. Right, I built the Lorentz transformations so that C would be the same in all frames. Okay. I'm seeing how it works out now, and uh, it's it's uh, illuminating to do that. And then similarly, if I if I if I point my my flashlight in the opposite direction, so that v p prime is minus c, okay. So put in minus c over here, and the same algebra will will take over, and you'll see that v p is also minus c. So the velocity of light is unaffected by the velocity of the, of the frame S prime. Okay. Okay, that's what we want to, to learn. Okay, now, I, now there's more, more to do. For example, uh, this, this particle over here uh, might not just be moving in the X direction, might move perpendicular or transverse to the, to the boost direction. Okay, okay. And then if you do that, you'll find a, a rather nasty looking formula uh, relating the velocity u sub p, that's the transverse velocity of the particle in either the prime frame or the unprimed frame, okay, they'll be, uh, they'll be related by gamma and then this, this denominator that we've, already, that we've already seen. So check the textbook for, for, the, for the derivation of, of the uh, transformation laws for the velocities perpendicular to the, uh, to the uh, uh, direction of the boost. Remember, the Lorentz transformation says that says that lengths transverse to v are unchanged. Okay, but if you look at velocities transverse to to uh, to the direction of the boost, you have you have to consider the motion of the particle and time dilation. Okay, and those effects uh, come into this formula and uh, and uh, and tell us uh, how how the velocity components in the y direction or the z direction transform from one frame uh, to the other. 
we'll have occasion to use these formulas, and I encourage you to look at the uh, look at the textbook uh, for the for the derivations. Okay, so that ends the first part of uh, of this lecture, and we'll return uh, uh, later and discuss uh, the second part, which will emphasize uh, uh, other properties of the Lorentz transformation.